Hey everyone, I'm in Taipei this week. Beautiful place, highly recommend that you come and check it out. So I was just going to make this video about some of the technologies that I'm going to be trying out in 2023. 2022, I used a whole bunch of new stuff, um, especially focused on the back end, Linux focused, and I'll get into a little bit of that at the moment. But with ChatGPT recently getting so much attention and blockchain seems to have lost a bit of its luster, uh, I wanted to list out some of the stuff that I'm going to be focusing on. So I'm going to start with the front end stuff and most of the projects I've been making until now have been using Vue.js and I found the whole thing with Vue 2 to Vue 3 really tiring. It's very frustrating. There was a lot of breaking changes. Having said that, I've decided I'm probably just going to stick with, with the Vue framework for the time being for my front end projects. God forbid I want to go back to React. Not sure. And I might make a separate video on why the one may be better than the other. But given that uh, Nux 3 is now available uh, and that it's highly unlikely that there's ever going to be any future breaking changes, uh, at least we can hope not, then uh, this one. Any hall? Ah, mail, mail. Cool, how is it? Um, Anyway, so someone's looking for for money. Anyway, so I might make a separate video on why why Vue.js is better than, uh, or not better than, but a good option with, as opposed to React. Uh, I've also built projects in React. I think for the moment, uh, with the exception of React Native, I'd probably just stick with Vue.js for some of my projects. And the big reason for that is that Nuxt and Vue 3 uh, and Nux 3 have much better TypeScript support than Vue 2, which was really one of my biggest frustrations with Vue, is that uh, React yeah, was ahead of the curve, way ahead when it came to TypeScript support. Uh, next, I'll get into maybe some of the some of the backend frameworks that I'm looking at using, and then I'll get into some of the cloud and DevOps and and a few other maybe tools. But when it comes to the backend. Uh, most of the stuff that I usually write is with Node.js using Express uh, and I've been broadly pretty happy with that. It's very easy to whip up a server, uh, there's tons, there's a massive community for Express. Uh, it's very easy because you've got, you've got TypeScript on the back end and you've got it on the front end. So when it comes to creating a new project, you can hire developers more easily, you can also switch between that. And I've previously written an article on, you know, comparing the Flask Python backend framework to to Node.js and Express. But to be honest, you know, there's a lot of benefits to having a single language across the stack. Having said that, sometimes it can be really boring working on the same language all the time. And as a big advocate, and in, I really enjoy using Python. So this year, I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff with with Fast API. And Fast API is a relatively new Python backend framework, uh, REST framework, and it's incredible. I recently just shifted one of my microservices from from Flask to Fast API, and I must say that the development experience is just really top notch. If you compare that to Flask, and it's not it's not ragging on Flask. Flask is a great micro framework, but it gives you automated documentation straight out of the box. It has really utilizes the, uh, the Python type hints at runtime. So you've got a lot of, uh, I guess you feel extremely safe when it comes to the data that you're moving around. You, you, you get automated validation uh, and it's a really great framework so far. I'm super impressed. And one of the best things that it has is it has got a really great async IO support. So one of the great things about Node.js is that you've got um, asynchronous, async await, uh, you know, the way that, that TypeScript deals with promises. It's really great for IO microservices. And while there's a lot of great Python backend frameworks like Django, like Flask, and you can achieve that same, well, maybe not the same, but you, you can still achieve asynchronous 
uh, calls and using the async IO library. Fast uh, FastAPI does this all for you. So that is one of the really great appeals. So when you compare FastAPI to Node.js, it's still not as performant. Obviously, it depends on exactly the task, but it's it's still highly performant. When, when you're dealing with businesses like I am, uh, the performance or the optimization of the code, while it's important, it's, it's not the most fundamentally important aspect of any project because the development speed and also the development experience, uh, you're, you're rarely going to be dealing with the kind of volume uh, that's really going to be noticeable between, say, Faster API and Node.js. And if you were really concerned with that anyway, you would probably go and use a language like Golang, uh, which kind of gets onto my next point. Uh, so dealt with front end, uh, looking at some of the back end frameworks. And uh, when it comes to back end languages, I'm still yet to really dive in deep into a, a, a lower level language like Rust or Golang. And for 2023, that's going to be one of the things that I do. Uh, I've previously done a bit with with C and uh, especially around security when it comes to uh, looking at memory allocation and all of that good stuff. I think it makes you a profoundly better developer if you understand how these things work. And it sees great from that uh, perspective and sure there's a lot of C code out there. But for me, this year I'm either gonna be uh, learning Golang or I'll be learning Rust. And not, not really so much for commercial reasons. I think that Python and TypeScript, JavaScript are gonna be pretty much sufficient for what I need most of the time. Uh, but more just from a learning standpoint and understanding what, uh, how these lower level languages work uh, so that I can just be a better developer and do some of my own personal projects. Uh, so that's, that's that. A few other things that I'll just put in the tooling basket. So. One thing that I increasingly got frustrated with was the IDEs. I was with uh, VS Code, and then I would switch to uh, switch to WebStorm, and there. And then I had PyCharm, and they're they're all great. Don't get me wrong, but sometimes you you really don't need that heavy of an IDE, and sometimes it was very slow as well. Uh, when when you're working on a big project and and like quickly finding files, linting and everything. And the, the, the machines that I use, they're, they're, they've got a lot, of, like they've got, my main machine has 32 gig of RAM. It's got, it's got a i7 11th gen processor. They're, they're not slow machines, um, but this is pretty heavy duty IDEs that we're talking about. And so increasingly I've started to shift to Vim, not just the Vim motions for within the editor, but also using NeoVim as my actual IDE. Uh, you can check out my GitHub to see uh, my config for my NeoVim, but originally I was thinking, okay, I'm just gonna use this for small projects, for scripts that I write, for navigating around. But to be honest, I've been so, feel so comfortable in there uh, using NeoVim with Tmux, and there's great plugins that you can really get exactly the experience you want. I'm not saying I'm 100% satisfied yet from a debugging standpoint and when it comes to really hardcore development, there's still a few things that I need to sort out with my config, but it's it's super quick and uh, it gets rid of a lot of the junk that you get when you have one of those, those really um, heavy IDEs. So that's going to be one thing uh, that I'm also going to look at in the coming year. Uh, from, from a tooling standpoint, I can't really end this video without talking about ChatGPT. I have been playing around this week with it and getting it to write some basic CSS. Uh, I just don't really enjoy that stuff. So as much as I can automate out of that as possible is great. I would say, you know, and I'm, I'm gonna make a separate video on this entirely, but it's not gonna replace our jobs as software engineers, software developers, but it is a great tool. It's like having a, a, a handy sidekick. It's like a stack overflow. Uh, it's just another tool in the shed and you can you can have it available. So for example, I, I wanted to update the CSS on my, my blog. I told it exactly what I wanted. And then with a few tweaks, because you know how to read and write CSS yourself, 
you can actually um, achieve really standout results probably in significantly less time. Mm -hmm. The whole idea that we're going to tell this AI that, oh, okay, create me a SaaS business in this domain and servicing these customers using this tech stack, I mean, that it's totally not capable of that and probably wouldn't be for decades. God forbid it ever is. If it ever is, and, and of course it will be one day, but if, there, if and when it is, uh, there's going to be basically no jobs left in the economy whatsoever. So I'm going to be using ChatGPT more, I think. I think uh, I, I enjoyed the initial experience that I had with it and I'm going to continue to use it, but I'm just going to use it what I found in the same way that sometimes I have to refer to the documentation or I have to go to Stack Overflow or whatever it may be to to get the best um, or to solve an issue that I'm experiencing. So that's that's one of the other things that I'm going to be working with. Yeah, so when it comes to cloud services, I've increasingly been using Cloudflare and nothing wrong with AWS. AWS is still my go-to for any commercial projects, I think, but uh, Cloudflare seems pretty cool. It's definitely on the lower end uh, when it comes to expenses. I know that there's a number of other uh, providers out there. Increasingly, I've been self-hosting. Uh, there's a lot that you can do with just use, like a Raspberry Pi at home or like an old computer. Um, I've started posting quite a few things there because not only from the standpoint of um, costs, I mean, these are all hobby projects, so they're not making any money and I don't need to be then spending any money on the hosting aspect, but also because, you know, learning about all the networking and, and all the, uh, the setup that goes behind hosting and deploying all of that to your own local environment, learning about dockerization and Kubernetes and all this kind of stuff you can actually do. You don't even need those cloud providers. So uh, from, a, from a cloud standpoint, I'm gonna be using uh, Cloudflare, I think, a lot. And then uh, for commercial projects, I will be using AWS. Now, of course, this is just a few different technologies you never know what the what the future is going to hold I'd be interested to hear about which technologies you're looking at this year uh, if you think I've missed any really important upcoming technologies uh, drop a comment below